This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 232, recorded on December 17th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How's it going, Michael? It's going well. We're rolling out uh, the first lot of the Pfizer vaccine. We're anxiously awaiting the Moderna, but I'm still, I still have 33,000 folks in front of me in Charleston. All right. Also joining us from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Did you get vaccinated yet, Elio? No, not yet. I'm waiting for it. It's going to be a be, while. Yeah, you're, you should be number one. I should be on account of my <laughs> venerable age. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and importance, your value to us. That's right. Oh, That's what I was I... thinking. That's what I was thinking, the uh, importance to us. And, and from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello, where we have a little bit of snow, but not as much as you, Vincent. Yeah, we have about 10 inches here. I was just on a call with someone from Vermont, and they have two feet in Ooh, Vermont. Oh, my God. So oh I spent the uh, I spent the morning uh, clearing my driveway with my trusty snowblower. It's, Don't uh, you have a son? <laughs> oh come on! I have <laughs> one son at home. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even bother to ask him to help me. All right. Was it the wet snow or the pretty fluffy snow? It was pretty fluffy. I started about nine a.m. It was still chilly, and then when I was done, he came out and said, "Can I help you, Dad?" <laughs> <laughs> when yeah, I was a done, hot toddy. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, get my, I need the exercise, uh, but uh, it's very pretty. And um, so I stayed home today because the roads are bad, but I'll, I'll crawl into the lab tomorrow. But, you know, nor rain nor snow, twim goes on. However, the yes. saying goes, we are more reliable than the U.S. Postal Service, <laughs> in fact. And we have for your listening pleasure today. Too. Yes, <laughs> we have. Cheaper. First up, a snippet from Alio. All righty. The paper I'm going to discuss is entitled Crosstalk Between Individual Phenol Soluble Modulins in Staphylococcus aureus Biofilm Enables Rapid and Efficient Amyloid Formation. <laughs> and the authors are Mashu Zaman and Maria Andresen from Aarhus University in Denmark. Now, what this is about is the fact that amyloids is a name given to sticks of protein, which are found almost everywhere. And the name, I have spent one minute about the name, amyloid. Amyloid means starch-like. What happened, that the great pathologist of the 19th century, Virchow, thought these were, when he saw these things, they stayed in a special way, and he thought they were made up of starch. Hmm. So he called them amyloid. They're not starch at all. <laughs> they're made up of proteins. <laughs> and they're made up of small proteins, which in the case of Staph aureus, happen to be soluble in hot phenol. And hmm. they're known as modulins in Staphylococcus aureus. However, they are widespread and amyloids are found all over the place. So I'm going to spend a little time discussing what are amyloids and why are they important. So they are made up of about 20 amino acids, or small proteins. By the way, the subject of small proteins seems to get a lot of currency these days. <laughs> uh, we spend all our lives dealing with big proteins. Now small proteins have their, their, their place in the sun. <laughs> okay. So amyloids are found everywhere, bacteria and humans and everything, and they are involved in disease in some fashion. They're also involved in making biofilms and therefore in host colonization. 
they are uh, found in, in E. coli, they're called curly, C-U-R-L-I. In uh, Pseudomonas, fluorescence, and Bacillus artis, they have other names. And in Staph aureus, they are known as phenol soluble modulins. That's not the, that's not curly, that's not the, the amyloids, that's the basic unit that makes amyloids. Amyloids are an assemblage of these small proteins. So when, as, but the single monomer, uh, monomers, the, um, things that go into making amyloids decrease the immune response by lysing uh, polymorphonucleus and by decreasing the amount of biofilm. So they're uh, both helpful and not helpful to the host. However, when they aggregate into amyloid fibers, they are all over the place. So in fact, in humans... They're important because they're involved in a lot of diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, uh, Kreutzfeldt, Jacob disease, hunting disease, a whole lot of them. So they matter a great deal for human disease, and they're found there all over. In bacteria, as I say, they're found in curly, which are little sticks, pili like, they're not pili, but pili like. They stick out of E. coli. They're found in gas vesicles, in biofilms, and in yeast, they function as prions. Mm. So they're all over the place. So I, knowing amyloids is important. Folks, if you don't know about amyloids, please find out because they are really important. <laughs> so the question is, what is the? how do they aggregate? How do these subunits aggregate into amyloids? And the answer is, they do it by a complicated set of physical chemical studies, which are the subject of this paper and a lot of other papers. So uh, the different kinetics, the different aggregation kinetics for different, uh, there are different aggregation kinetics for different kinds of amyloids. So uh, they go into two steps. One is the primary nucleation, which is making a fiber out of individual subunits, and the other is secondary nucleation, which is once you have the primary nucleated fiber, you add to it other proteins, and that is called secondary nucleation. And the rates of elongation vary about a thousandfold between one and another kind of these, these guys. So... Uh, they, what do they study here? They study using EM. They study how long does it take to make fibers. It takes about a week. And after mm-hmm. a week, you see, and there's nice EMs here, of tangled fibers. Fibers. Now, there are seven different kinds of phenol-soluble modules in Staph aureus. Remember, these are the subunits that go into making amyloids. And they are different in uh, the way they do it. So this is a study that tells you the individual behavior of the uh, uh, modulins. So they are all over the place. There are, some are very fast, some are very slow. And I think I'll leave it there because the rest of it is really a study in uh, the, the kinetics of formation of the amyloids. And the, the conclusion that is derived from this is they're all different. So I, I can't say much more than that because there is no connection between how fast they are uh, aggregate and what they do. That It varies all over the map. But they are, uh, some are more efficient and faster in making biofilms uh, through the cooperation of individual peptides. So what do you say? Are amyloids here to stay? <laughs> well, amyloids are definitely here to stay. And one of the things that you didn't actually highlight is the fact that where we see staphylococci forming biofilms is in catheters. When you put in these indwelling devices into people, these PSMs or phenol soluble modulins are effectively, if you will, sinking piles into 
those structures so they can literally physically attach to that material. And that's often what causes these nosocomial infection development. So this is a real important finding because it gives the biotechnologists, microbiologists, antimicrobial investigator a new target to go after. And this reminds me of the uh, story that we did on a few twims ago about Alzheimer's in the gingipan protease that mm. facilitated uh, amyloid development in the brain of people and how they had a new protease that they developed to give as an ethical pharmaceutical to dissolve this amyloid plaque mm. forming. So the question is, could we make an inhibitor to this PSM formation so they don't form these scaffolding that the bacteria literally start building this microbial community around, that could be a game changer for nosocomial infections. So this is a really exciting paper. Not only a game changer, but a lifesaver. Yes, absolutely. So because the biofilm is essential for colonization, is that right? Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. more importantly, the, what we now know about biofilms is a large fraction of the biofilm community is considered to be viable and non-culturable. And that makes them extremely refractory to antimicrobials. So if the patient is continuously growing this biofilm that's growing very slowly, but occasionally they throw off a planktonic version of Hold the Hold on, staff- Michael. Uh, Alio's coming back. Hello. I'm back. I'm back. I'm okay. sorry. It's okay. Michael, you were talking about... I was talking about biofilms and the game-changing and the game-changing activity that this paper literally throws down the gauntlet to investigators across the microbial spectrum to encourage them to figure out how we can interfere with this modulin cascade that these investigators so elegantly defined for us. It's, it's really a, I think going to be a seminal paper for how it gives us a new target to go after. Good. So you, you thinking we, we can make inhibitors of amyloid, right? That'll, in, that'll block biofilm, biofilm yeah, formation, right? Yes. And these are going to be what are they going to be small molecules? You think that are going to bind to the protein and prevent its assembly? You think that's my working hypothesis. It will just interfere, Hmm. akin to the way uh, a lot of folks are thinking about making um, antivirals to interfere with some of the subunit assembly of viruses. Yeah, yeah. In -hmm. fact, there is a. Hepatitis B virus antiviral that blocks assembly. Yeah. Uh, similar. It's There are not a lot of them, but yes, you can do that. Um, so is it – do many bacteria make biofilms, right, in, in uh, infections? Do they all depend on amyloid? It's a good question. Uh, we know E. coli has it. We know Pseudomonas has it. And mm. Pseudomonas is one of the best biofilm formers. It also makes extracellular um, matrix pro- matrix material that uh-huh. really adds to the vi- viscosity and impedes uh, penetration of antimicrobials into the biofilm community, which also makes them refractory uh-huh, to right. treatment. So if you could – disrupt the biofilm, it need not completely inhibit growth because then you could add an antibiotic and that would be able to get to the bacteria, right? Absolutely. It would flush, it would effectively weaken the foundation of the house. It's like removing two by fours out of your roof (laughs) trusses and the whole thing will come down. Yeah. Got it. All right. Very cool. Michelle, your, your bacteria, does it make biofilms? It does, but they haven't been very well studied, so I can't answer your question about amyloids, but um, of, about Legionella. Yeah. Um, but I'll say that biofilms are very common in the uh, environmental 
microbial world. Yeah. And my guess is that some will rely on an amyloid type um, molecule for their extracellular matrix and others will use different strategies. Neat. Very good. So, Elio, I noticed that you pronounced Ohus perfectly. Because I know you lived in Denmark for a double A in Danish is an O. Oh yeah, so I visited them uh, last year, and they had to teach me how to pronounce it. And um, Aarhus, and I, Aarhus, yeah, it's a it's a good university. You didn't study there, did you? You were you were in Copenhagen. No, I, I, started, I, I worked in Copenhagen for two years. But you but know, I you got some Danish. Okay, yeah, it's great. My so, my know, boss cast me out to say this is the biggest waste of time. Why would you do that for? <laughs> <laughs> to learn Danish? Yeah. Was that it's, Ole it's Melo? Five million people. Was that Ole Ule Melo? Ole Molo. Ole Molo. Ole Molo. <laughs> okay. I had a lot of trouble with my Danish guests on, on uh, TWIV. I had a hard time, but they said in the end, we're happy you tried. <laughs> 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 right? Isn't that a good compliment when you try? But, you know, yeah. D- Denmark... Uh, I had a big problem with minks and COVID. You guys mm-hmm. probably heard that the minks got infected, and that's not a right. good thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, Elio. My pleasure. All right, uh, now we have we're going we're to talk about electricity, <laughs> Michelle. Yeah, but we're going to build on the biofilm theme and hopefully um, convey that biofilms aren't all bad. Mm, There's some true. applications uh, in the future. So the theme here is sustainability. So currently, our many electronic devices rely on manufactured wiring that's not biodegradable. So imagine mm. a future where our electronic electrical currents are instead run on filaments generated by microbes. Mm. So this would be a future of renewable, biodegradable, sustainable bioelectronics. So we're going to share the latest advance in this exciting new field of electromicrobiology with a paper titled, Electric Field Stimulates Production of Highly Conductive Microbial OMC-Z Nanowires. And it was published in October of this year in Nature Chemical Biology by a large group from Yale. Um, and the authors, the first, the co-first authors are Sybil Yelson and Patrick O'Brien. And they're um, both in Nikhil Malvonker's lab and were assisted by colleagues Gu, Reese, Yi, Jian, Sirkant, Dahl, Hyun, Vu, Ashera, Shadhira, Varga, Batista. Shadhari. <laughs> pardon my, pardon my uh, butchering of the language. So... To set the stage, um, I'd like to talk about what is was known, um, what had been accomplishments previously in this field of bioelectronics. So in 2005, Hema Regera and her colleagues in Derek Lovely's group at UMass Amherst reported that a bacterium, Geobacter sulfurreducens, can use pili to breathe or respire. But in anaerobic environments, these microbes dump their electrons Um, electrons onto extracellular minerals like iron and manganese rather than oxygen, which is what we usually think of when we think of respiration. Not only that, but the electronics travel along pili that extend out from the bacterial surface, out from their outer membrane, onto these minerals in the soil. So then um, we can follow that up in 2011 as described on TWIM episode 14. <laughs> One of the um, few TWIMs that Vincent wasn't part of. We had, yeah. this was the early days of Elio, Michael, Margaret McFall, Nye, and we had your good buddy Stan Malloy join us that day, Elio. TWIM 14. Wow. Yeah. So that, that was a paper um, published in Nature Nanotechnology by a senior author. This is was his first first author paper as a trainee in Derek Lovely's group. Um, and they showed that filaments made by Geobacter could um, conduct electricity off across distances more than a thousand fold greater than the size of the bacterial cell. And this electric current was sensitive to temperature also genetic changes they made in the bacterium and and to the voltage applied. Mm. 
So clearly they're building some momentum, um, getting to manipulate these um, bacterial nanowires and, you know, they hold great, great promise. And I'm sure you made that crystal clear and fascinating in your discussion back in TWIM 14. So then in 2019, um, this same group published in Cell of 19, the structure of the first um, nanowire, and it was made by a polymer of OMCS. So the OMC stands for outer membrane cytochrome, and Geobacter makes um, a handful of them. And this was interesting because, um, first of all, from the earlier work, they had thought pill A type 4 pillin was probably the conductor. And so it was the favorite um, candidate for all of this. But in this CELT 2019 paper, um, Malvonker's group showed really convincingly that um, a filament instead was made of this OMCS protein. Um, but pill A was required uh, for its assembly. So um, instead of, of the pill A type 4 pillin, um, this was a filament made of type C cytochrome proteins, which some of you may recall um, form the electron transport chain that powers ATP synthesis in our mitochondrial membranes. So instead of it being in a membrane, these are cytochromes that, that can polymerize and extend out from cells and carry electrons. So that is the topic of today's paper. And what they're going to um, describe, what they have reported, is a new nanowire made of a polymer of geobacter um, made of the protein OMCZ. And they're going to have beautiful data that show it can conduct electronic current a thousand times faster than the last filament that they characterized, the OMCS. So how in the world does this happen? Well, to find out, they put together an amazing team of experts in multiple fields, microbiologists, biophysicists, biochemists, imaging experts. And just to illustrate that, um, the team came from multiple departments at Yale, the Department of Biochemistry, or sorry, Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, the Microbial Sciences Institute, the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, the Department of Chemistry, and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And they also worked with a colleague at a um, Department of Energy National Lab, the Pacific Northwest National Lab. So they brought to bear some really sophisticated um, techniques. They sound like just... un-Americans who get along from many different departments of the same university. <laughs> Getting along and talking to each other, my God! <laughs> well, I'm sure I'm sure more people would have loved to work on this project too if they had a chance. I bet he had no problem recruiting people. So, how were they able to do this? Um, they really used some very sophisticated techniques um, to do a number of things. They were able to um, identify the protein composition and architecture of these filaments using atomic force microscopy. They also could deduce components by their characteristic infrared vibrational patterns using infrared nanospectroscopy, using the technique scattering type scanning near field optical microscopy. I'm going to say all these terms because it makes me feel smart just saying. <laughs> <laughs> they also were able to measure electron transport along the filaments using conducting probe atomic force microscopy. And they could measure the stiffness of the filament using nanomechanical atomic force microscopy. So let's get into this. What was the approach? They were able to culture geobacter on um, in, in what they called microbial fuel cells. So they cultured them on graphite anodes and added fumarate as two um, electron acceptors. And then they connected the anode to a cathode so that they could impose an electrical field, or they left it unconnected. And what they discovered is that the amount, first, the first discovery was that the amount of OMCZ protein in these biofilms was increased when they added electrical current. So compared to free-living geobacter cells, the cells in biofilms with an electric current, had a large increase in the amount of OMZ protein. They also looked by cryo-EM to look at really um, 
down to the you know three and four angstrom uh, resolution, that they found um, filaments of two and a half nanometer in diameter, and then others of three and a half nanometers in diameter um, in their preparations. So this was intriguing to them. They also then um, studied the helical pattern of these um, filaments and found that they um, likely encoded uh, a 30 kD protein. And again, that was consistent with OMCZ being the primary um, component of these uh, filaments. So now um, they want to verify that it truly these truly are filaments made with OMCZ, in part because this group previously had been pursuing um, the model that pill A type 4 pill line were, um, were the major conductors. So they um, took a number of approaches. They analyzed filaments in an OMCS mutant. They also overexpressed the OMCZ protein and studied those cells. They used immunogold staining to look at um, whether OMCZ antigen was present in the filaments, and they did that both in wild type and OMCZ mutants. And all of the all of the data together verified that yes, they can be confident that this is an OMCZ um, filament. So now they want to study the structure and function of the of this um, filament. So to look in more detail at the topology of these filaments, they used this infrared scattering type scanning near field optical microscopy. And previously, these people had used this technique to study how um, water binds to minerals. But now they want to apply it to study protein topology. So this is innovative. And before studying their unknown protein, they wisely chose to validate their strategy by using it to analyze two proteins whose structures are already um, out in the literature. So they use bacteria rhodopsin and lysozyme. All right, so after using this to, to characterize the bacteria rhodopsin and lysozyme, they then turned to study OMP-S and OMP-Z. And what they found using this technique was that OMP-S is primarily made of alpha helices, whereas the OMP OMCZ polymer is primarily beta sheets. And um, having demonstrated that the measurements they obtained with this new technique were um, similar to those published in the literature, they were then in a position to um, study their OMCZ uh, filaments. So um, what they found is that the topology was consistent with it being a polymer of OMCZ, and they then wanted to um, study the conductance of electrons across these filaments. So to do that, they took the filaments and they had them straddle a silicon dioxide substrate and a gold um, acceptor. And then they took the tip of their um, device on this atomic force microscope and could um, then measure conductance at different um, distances along the filament and in that way quantify the resistance and then um, calculate conductance. And what they found uh, was that these OMCZ filaments were a thousand times more uh, conductive than the previously characterized filament made by OMCS. So this is remarkable. This um, geobacter bacterium can make different filaments. And here we have two different ones. They each can conduct current, but one does so a thousand times more efficient. So this is a great opportunity now to look at the structures of OMCS and OMCZ and then be able to deduce what um, features of the topology and the structure account for this thousandfold difference in the ability of electrons to quickly hop, hop, hop along the, the filament great distances. So in order to get more structural detail, they used grazing incidence x-ray diffraction. So in this method, um, you take an x-ray beam and you go down to eye level with your sample and you direct that beam at a really low angle and then measure where the beam hits the sample and deflects. So if you do that across your whole sample, you can then collect all that deflection information and then back calculate and um, deduce what the topology of their sample was. 
So by doing that, they were able to um, report that the um, molecule, which they already knew, OMCZ, they already knew had was made of um, eight different heme groups. Each protein has eight different heme groups. And they were able to measure the distance between these heme groups. So why are they so interested in hemes? These are ring-like molecules that coordinate a metal in the typically uh, iron, for example, like in hemoglobin, um, there's iron. And it can allow, um, it can bind oxygen, for example, in hemoglobin. But these um, large ring uh, molecules or heme groups um, would make great platforms for electrons to land on and then launch and travel on to the next heme group in the um, polymer. So that was the model that they were interested in testing. So by um, using these fancy spectroscopy and imaging methods, they were able to deduce that the OMCS protein has six, which they knew had six hemes within its 45 kilodalton structure. Um, only two of those heme groups were had their, um, their ring structures within three and a half to four angstroms, which they knew um, was the about, about the limit that one, any one electron could hop from one heme group to another. In contrast, the OMCZ um, protein is smaller. It's only 30 kilodaltons, and yet it has eight hemes within that 30 kilodalton. And five of those heme groups are positions such that they're within three and a half to four angstroms. And therefore, those are five um, steps that electrons could hop within each um, monomer of OMCZ. So that looked very promising, and they could begin to imagine how a polymer of OMCZ could be so efficient at um, allowing these electrons to flow. So next, they followed up on a really interesting prior observation that when they looked at their filaments at pH 7 and measured conductance and compared that to um, pH 2, they saw an increase in conductance. So somehow lowering the pH was increasing electron flow across these um, polymers. So uh, what they did is um, measured the structure physical structure of the filaments at two different pHs. And they found that for both OMCS and OMCZ, when they lowered the pH, the filament got more narrow. So in the case of OMCS, it narrowed by 50%. And for OMCZ, it narrowed by 40%. So this is really remarkable. They're getting a major structural um, change at lower pH that correlates with a large increase in conductance. So what could account for, for these shape changes and how could that help these electronics jump uh, from heme group to heme group? So um, they then, again, relying on these um, really sophisticated imaging techniques, they looked at the uh, structures of their OMCS and OMCZ filaments at pH 7 or pH Two. And what they found is that for OMCS, for example, at pH 7, it's primarily in alpha helical and coil uh, shape. But when they sh lowered the pH, it shifted to having um, seven times more beta sheets and also increased its stiffness. They found the same pattern with OMCZ, and it was even more dramatic. So recall that when they make their OMCZ filaments and they drop the pH from 7 down to 2, they got an increase in conductance of 100-fold. They also got an increase in its stiffness. And like the OMCS filament, it now had three times more beta sheets than it had at the neutral pH. So they're really interested in whether these beta sheets are um, accounting and contributing to the increased stiffness and also the um, more narrow filament and, more importantly, the more efficient conductance of electronics uh, of electrons down the filament. So they they brought out four more types of spectroscopy to um, really 
test their model, test their interpretation of the pH 7 versus pH 2. So they used Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, fluorescence emission spectroscopy, and circular dichroism spectroscopy. And sure enough, um, in each case, they independently saw that the polymers increased the amount of beta sheet structure when they dropped the pH down to 2. So this was uh, really interesting to them. They verified it, too, by using an independent method. Um, there is a fluorescent dye that's known to bind to beta sheets called thioflavin Z, and they showed that, sure enough, their OMC-Z filaments, when dropped down to pH 2, um, now bind much more thioflavin, consistent with this dramatic change in the shape of each of the um, OMCZ monomers to form this polymer that would um, that correlates then with greater conductance of electrons, and that makes sense because again, think about if you're uh, um, out hiking and you're on the bank of a river and you look across. Um, the creek or river and try to figure out how you're going to get across, you eyeball what the distance is between the various rocks or logs that are sticking up from the water. And what they've found is that these um, filaments made by Geobacter have got these heme groups that align in parallel fashion quite close together. And really the, the king of all this is the OMCZ protein at pH um, 2, where the the um, landing pads of these uh, rings, heme groups, are close enough that electrons can really scoot across this long filament um, very quickly. In fact, these nanowires um, made of OMCZ polymers, so biological polymers, are able to conduct electricity at 10 to the 6th have a conductance of 10 to the 6 times faster than any current synthetic and biodegradable um, wires. So this is um, super exciting, and they are interested in whether they can now understand even in more detail um, how these um, polymers change their shape under different pHs and other conditions, and can they take advantage of those dramatic shifts from pH 7 to pH uh, 2, for example, and use that as a um, signal in electrical devices or use it um, as a memory of what, um, what conditions the, um, the device had been exposed to, for example. So I think that um, with one's imagination, um, you can think of a lot of potential applications for these biological nanowires that um, could be tuned genetically um, and also by uh, changing the temperature or pH at which they're held. And also, um, they would be biodegradable. So I think this um, shows what an exciting field this electromicrobiology can be. And um, certainly, uh, this group is one to watch. This group and um, Derek Lovely's group at UMass, UMass um, Amherst are really um, making great progress in this area. Biodegradable, but but not um, falling apart, right? So my iPhone is not going to no. fall apart. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's not going to fall. Uh, I mean, what's really remarkable <laughs> about this is both the first and last author, last authors, uh, Dr. Sybil Yelson, who's a nanoscale spectroscopist, mm -hmm. and her principal area of focus. And this makes me feel really smart when I say this is on multimodal imaging of bacterial <laughs> systems to correlate structure with electrical, mechanical, and optical properties. Dr. Yelson is a research scientist within this group, and she was born in Turkey. During her PhD, she developed the first microscope. So she's up there with von Leeuwenhoek. <laughs> she developed the first microscope. No, think about, listen to what I'm about to say. She developed the first microscope capable of visualizing plasmon pulses at an unprecedented rate of 50 mm -hmm. femtoseconds or less. Mm -hmm. That's one quadrillionth of a second, or in one femtosecond, light travels 300 nanometers. That gives you 
we all know the speed of light is very fast, but one femtosecond light can only move 300 nanometers. If you will, that's approximately three SARS-CoV-2 viruses sitting <laughs> next to one another. Very good. Very good. <laughs> uh, and, then, and, and Dr. Uh, Nick Heil, the senior officer, Dr. Nick Heil Mavakar, is a biophysicist working on developing electronic control of bacterial behavior via natural and synthetic protein nanowires. And as Michelle walked us through the foundational science, you really get a sense of why we need a physicist here. Because when I unpacked the content in here, they this interdisciplinary team is trying to solve one of the great mysteries of life, namely where to dump our trash. And here is where they offer us how the microbial world adapts and improvises when it has no place to put its waste electrons, it makes a wire and attaches it to something else to send the waste downstream. And when there is an electrical current present, it builds a better wire. It's akin to you in your house having an Ethernet wire that was installed 30 years ago with CAT3 wire or CAT4 wire. The technician comes out to your house and you say you want gigabit speed. And he said, well, I'm going to have to put in CAT6 wire. That's going to cost you. (laughs) And that's because the wire is more able to conduct the waste electrons. Now, when you think about this from a bacterial perspective, It's all about fitness. The more electrons you can toss over the side, the more carbon you can burn and the faster you can grow. So by virtue of the fact that this microbe was able to make a better polymer that could carry waste away from it faster without a fitness penalty, and it only makes it in the presence of the anode being able to take the electrons. This is really a remarkable observation. And I don't think a a classically trained microbiologist could necessarily make this observation because there's Maxwell equations involved here. And those were a long time ago for me. (laughs) But this is fundamental electricity. And They're banking on the fact, and as Michelle articulated, when the pH drops, what we know about pH is that it's proton concentration, and that means it's plus, it's partial plus. And so as the proton concentration increases, the ability of that that electron- Uh covid the COVID, send the police. That <laughs> electron to find a pair to effectively find its mate, if you mm. will, it facilitates the transfer of that energy. And that's been the bottleneck in biological-based wire because we can't carry enough electrons to do our electronics fast enough because copper is the king at room temperature and copper is as close as we can get to good as to superconductivity where there's no resistance penalty. And anyone who's ever charged their iPhone knows that it gets hot and that's the electrons moving into your battery, creating friction as they move through. And we know bacteria have a very tight temperature tolerance. Hmm. So again, by virtue of the fact that they can put more of the waste electrons or the current as it flows down this pipe, it's as if the microbe has built a bigger pipe to dump the electrons. So these authors have done a, a great task for us in helping us appreciate that Peter Mitchell was right. You have to remember delta psi, the change in charge, 
and the change in chemical potential, which is pH, to explain all things energy in the microbial and biological world. Michael, can you tell us anything else about the the author here? Let's see. Uh, Yeltsin was the is the physicist. She did her postdoc at PNNL, and the senior author. Uh, let me see. What else do I know? She she was trained as a chemist, hmm. and she's been at Yale since. Um, uh, it looks approximately 2017, and prior to that, she did a postdoc at PNNL, the Pacific Northwest Laboratory, where she joined them after working in the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at Los Alamos National Laboratory, mm. and she got her degree from uh, Derek Lovely's uh, institution, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Dr. Nikhail Malvikar is a biophysicist working on the development of the electronics, and he's an assistant professor of biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University. And his research has uncovered this fundamentally new property of electrical conductivity in bacterial protein nanowires. No microbiologists here, huh? No, this is this is a... But he did a postdoc with Derek Lovely, who we got to uh-huh. credit Derek for dropping him into the deep end of the pool and bringing <laughs> him into the microbial world. It's amazing. Well, because Derek, you don't need to do much microbiology, right, Michelle, to do these experiments. Well, I think we had you a grove of bacteria. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, but to your point, um, Nikhil, we corresponded, and he um, was very excited that we were going to talk about this uh-huh. work and, and reflected on being featured in TWIM 14. And he said he's become a loyal listener to TWIM oh, since then nice. because oh. he, you know, as, as Michael said, he's not trained in microbiology and he's learned so much, including yeah. like the importance of genetic complementation and yeah. um, other nuances of uh, microbial genetics that um, were really important in realizing that while pill A definitely contributes to these um, nanowires, they're, they're not the main component mm. and that there's still some interesting biology to learn there. There's some regulatory linkage between the two. But um, I'm trying to understand how far we are from practical use of this. Do they give a sense at all? I mean, is it going to be a long time? The speeds are not there yet because, you know, silicon-based transistors and so forth are very, very, very fast, right? And I don't know how, how close these are to that. Well, I, I know one application of these um, filaments is in environments where you don't have um, oxygen and you don't, or sorry, you don't have a, um, a source of energy. So, for example, mm. they've been able to put um, a cathode in the um, subsurface of the ocean, and mm. Geobacter will form biofilms there, and um, they can extend those um, filaments up to a device up where the oxygen um, is present and put a, a metal there, like iron, for it to dump its electrons. And then you can capture that current to do um, different sensing uh, work that needs to be done, like tracking different populations of animals or mm. other other things that um, oceanographers would want to study. So that that's one um, application. Interesting. It's amazing. And the uh, blog Sci-Fi Wire probably sums up this paper in a very <laughs> cute way. It says in its title, the flash has nothing on these bacteria that ex- that exhale electricity, and we could soon use that power. Wow. And it, it, it's, a, it's a cute blog. I'll put it, it, a link to it in yeah. the show notes, and it really, I think, offers the promise and hopefully will inspire the next generation of scientists to think, how we can make biodegradable electronics. Yeah, that's amazing. I don't know what the time scale is, but maybe not in my lifetime. Um, Biology is amazing, as Michael it pointed is. out. Alio, I'm, this- I'm, I'm waiting for the bacteria to use alternative current. <laughs> AC. <laughs> Instead of direct AC. current. <laughs> yeah. Alio, the guy who invented the microscope, what, how do you pronounce his name? Leeuwenhoek. 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 Okay, I always wondered. Leeuwen, not Leuven, right? Hook. 
No, Leeuwenhoek. So the city uh, is called Leven. That's what I was told by a Dutchman. <laughs> a Dutchman, okay. That's a good source. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michael, for the color commentary. And um, stay tuned for your bacteria-driven iPhones. <laughs> we have a, a couple of email for you. One is from Elizabeth. Hello, Vincent, Elio, Michelle, and Michael. My fiancé and I really enjoy your show. I listen to it while analyzing data, and my fiancé listens to it while working with anaerobic bacteria in his lab. We are truly microbe-obsessed individuals holding five microbiology-related degrees between us. Wow. Ooh. Twin was a big inspiration to launch our own blog podcast, Microbials, microbials.com slash the microbe moment. We aim to share everyone's unique microbe moment and to show everyone is connected to microbes. In the last episode, we fe felt a real connection. Mark talked about Vampyrococcus lugosi and predatory bacteria. Back in October, we highlighted predatory bacteria in our series, The Macabre Masterpiece of Microbial Monsters, associating predatory bacteria to, of course, vampires. You close this episode by talking about Lynn Margulis, a hero, hero of mine and someone I look up to as an aspiring, aspiring female scientist. I enjoyed hearing Mark's story about connecting with Lynn. What a magical moment that must have been. We recently published a podcast featuring Le Esther Letterberg, another powerful female microbiologist. Mm. I was wondering if you had time to listen to this episode and give us some feedback or a shout out on TWIM as an est established microbial communicators. I highly value your opinions and aspire to create content as valuable as yours. Finally, I love the question. If you could talk to a microbe, what would you ask? <laughs> I would ask, how do you choose who to be, a commensal, a pathogen, or a symbiont to? I study Xylella fastidiosa, which is a grape, citrus, olive pathogen, but is found in many other plants and never causes harm. So I'm always asking, why grapevines? Cheers. So Elizabeth and John, and Elizabeth is a bio bioinformatician, and of course, founder of Microbigals, the host of the Micro Moment. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, there you go. Yeah, good for you, Elizabeth. I will try to listen, um, but I would say one challenge is deciding who your audience is. Do you want to speak to colleagues who have a solid foundation in your field, or do you instead want to make it accessible to a broad audience? Yep, yep for sure. If I had to ask one question of a bacterium, I'd say, what's your hurry? <laughs> what's your hurry? That's great. I like that very much. All right. Uh, one more email from Reese. Dear Twim, I'm a longtime listener to your podcast, have found it has helped me in my career in a medical microbiology lab. I'm now starting a new journey as a trainee clinical scientist, would like to become a clinical scientist or perhaps even a consultant microbiologist with a focus on helping treat non-healing and infected wounds. My thesis was on the antifungal bioactivity and wound healing properties of the medicinal maggot Lucilia sericata, and I have published two papers on the medical maggot, one partially characterizing their antifungal bioactivity and the second showing that they may produce growth factors analogous to human growth factors, which appear to affect fibroblast migration. So I have a deep interest in wound healing. I was wondering if you would perhaps consider reviewing and discussing a paper whereby the focus is management of bacterial infections in wounds, perhaps by affecting quorum sensing to reduce virulence factors in wounds or using predatory bacteria. I'd like to know what paper you would choose and your insights on the topic. Reese is in Wales, UK. And Michael, you know anything about uh, management uh, of bacterial infections in wound by affecting quorum sensing? No, I don't, but it gives me something to hunt. All right. Michael's a good hunter. He'll hunt it down. All right. That is uh, TWIM232. And you know, Michelle, did we ever consider who our audience is? I'm not sure we did. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I think about from time to time, for sure. I mean, I think on all the podcasts, we try and explain things clearly, but it is certainly still complex. And we attract people who want to be educated about complicated science and and there are some people out there that would like that and you know it's not everyone but i think we do all right 
All right, this is TWIM. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIM. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. And if you uh, want to send us a question or comment, TWIM at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, and I hope you all get to recharge your batteries over a lovely holiday season. Bacterial batteries? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.